Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Linda, and thanks to all of you. I have to preface this by saying buen camino to all of my students at Fordham. Today is the Feast of Santiago, uh, July 25th, and uh, I'm hoping at least one of my students managed to wake up this morning uh, to, to watch uh, from New York. The history of women and Catholicism is long entangled, involving dazzling beautiful myths based on female sanctity and sacrifice set against a more depressing, mundane reality rooted in exploitative labor and exclusion from power. The church is not simply a spiritual assembly. It is an organization and an institution dependent on work at the center, power and finance at the front. And here the evidence shows clearly that, except at Christianity's very beginning, and only intermittently since, women have done at least half of Roman Catholicism's work, culturally and physically. But this work has brought neither structural, nor financial, nor intellectual authority in the modern church. The contrast between devotion and power explains much of the historical tension in Catholic life and culture, a fact already evident in the New Testament. Women were among the first and most persistent disciples of Jesus, the last to remain at the cross and the very first to witness the resurrection. St. Paul's letters repeatedly greet active women while at other times admonishing them to silence and duty, even forbidding them to preach. In the culture of early Christianity, women as owners and managers of houses where Christians met were active in fostering, guiding, and financing the community. This is not to say that the early church was any kind of golden age for gender equality in Christianity. But at least at the beginning, there was room for women, not just at the center, but often at the front. When in the second century, the hierarchy began to differentiate into clerical offices holding sacramental powers, bishop, deacon, priest, women's roles in the emerging power structure diminished considerably. The early church was full of heroic women martyrs and virgins whose extraordinary physical and moral sufferings witnessed to Christian truth. As male-led Christian institutions grew more powerful, women's authority came to reside in their willingness to sacrifice themselves, first as virgin martyrs, then as virgins. In Mary, the mother of Jesus, churchmen described a woman whose strength and piety placed her at the center of the church but whose power came from resigning herself to God's will and remaining far from the front, distinguishing her from that other woman, the Madeline, now always presented as the repented, repentant, converted, penitent. The pattern then for later years was already set by the end of the fourth century. Christian men would deliberate and rule at the front, and Christian women would suffer and obey, usually in silence, but always at the center their spiritual and cultural work to display the blessedness of purity and the spiritual value of humility. For women in medieval and early modern Christianity, this pattern became the norm. By the 13th century, intellectual authority lay in the hands of universities and trained theologians serving an exclusively male hierarchy. While it would have been unheard of for socially for a woman to earn a doctorate, another development would also work to her exclusion, then and now. University theological faculties, many run by the new mendicant orders, Franciscans and Dominicans, increasingly required priests and ordination as the keys to intellectual and academic authority. In an age of suppressing heresy and exacting conformity, the church would not entrust doctrine to those it could not directly control. Excluded from power, women found themselves outside the boundaries of learning as well. The resulting misogyny, may or may not be intrinsic to Christianity, on which I think, frankly, the jury is still out. But in an institution organized around exclusively male power, it was inevitable, eventually entrenched, and frequently celebrated. Even so, women did assert themselves and push gently to the front of pastoral care and education, sometimes not so gently. As men established monasteries or became mendicants, women also organized into convents, and other unofficial associations, such as the Beguines, for prayer and for service, working outside the convent. Just as quickly, though, the Latin church sought to push them back. Enclosure, already common in Eastern Christianity, became officially a requirement for all women religious, first in the statute Periculoso of 1298, 
And by the mid-16th century, the Council of Trent banned all works of women's charity that seemed incompatible with enclosure. Henceforth, women's official religious orders had to preoccupy themselves with the education of young girls, a task for which the Ursulines became and remain famous. Even here, though, devout women found a means to organize and to act publicly in a meaningful way of their choosing. Frequently, this meant using mystical experiences to overcome official obstacles, as in the case of Teresa of Avila. Whatever the official position of the church on claustration, the importance of women's ministries to function and identity eventually forced ecclesiastics into some form of accommodation. Whether in or out of the cloister, women forged other paths through and around the official strictures of religious life. In 1633, for example, Vincent de Paul and Louise de Marillac founded the Daughters of Charity. Members took and renewed their vows annually rather than take solemn lifetime vows. Doing so allowed the order to avoid the strictures of the cloister, while the name daughters distanced them from more traditional nuns or sisters. In the 19th century, John Carroll and Elizabeth Ann Seton founded a similar order, the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph. But these women took solemn vows, though they worked outside the cloister. The success of the Daughters of Charity made clear just how necessary women active in the world were to the church's mission. And so by the end of the 18th century, the, pa the papacy was backing away from strict demands for claustration. Claustration is such a great word. Um, it says just about everything you need to know, really, about women in the church, unfortunately. For professionally religious women in America, it was in the 19th and 20th centuries that the indispensability of women's religious work became apparent. Whether caring for orphans in Philadelphia, such as my mother, working among the poor in Chicago, or teaching school children in my hometown of El Paso, Texas, the service of women religious provided the backbone of Catholic infrastructure in the United States. Simply put, there would be no widespread Catholic education or catechism in America without the presence of women religious. And yet, though women were in, though nuns were in the classroom, leading parish education, working tirelessly among the poor, and even earning advanced degrees, their authority depended on the goodwill of male bishops and priests. The sister who spent her year teaching second graders their catechism had to defer when father decided to visit for a day to test them. And for all their work, effort, and education, nuns were absent from the altar while priests administered the sacraments, the center of religious and sacral power in Catholicism. I can remember to this day the name of the nun who made me practice my first confession right down to the sins walked me through my first communion, strengthened my Catholic boy issue clip-on bow tie. That was Sister Mary O'Brien. The priest who heard the official confession, consecrated the host, placed it on my now, and the only time in my life, worthy tongue. I can't remember. <laughs> His name is lost to eternity. In the aftermath of Vatican II's call for Catholics to work in the world for justice and the poor, religious women answered yet again in a veritable explosion of new roles, from protesting the war to working for the rights of immigrants. It is at this historical point that the paradox of religious women in the church became most apparent. Women were working everywhere, earning professional and academic degrees across the board, including in sacred theology. Recognition, though, might come in the form of censure and backlash against the increased visibility and prominence of women in Catholicism, the desire to be at the altar even as an acolyte, Eucharistic minister, or the desire to be a theological ethicist teaching at one of America's premier divinity schools. So it was that in 2009, the church launched an investigation of some 340 congregations of women and in particular, a doctrinal assessment of the Leadership Conference of Catholic Women Religious, which represents a high percentage of America's 57,000 nuns. Now, following Vatican II's brief promise and the subsequent retrenchment, 
a new pope has made casual remarks that suggest a relatively an enhanced appreciation of women's work in the church. The apostolic visitation begun in 2009 has ended on a conciliatory note. American Catholic women, hungry for any positive sign, have responded with hope and enthusiasm. At the same time, with a hierarchy mostly appointed by two previous popes whose empathy for women's roles and their plight was limited, to say the least, it is difficult to imagine any sudden transformations in the relations of women in the church. And no matter how progressive in comparison with his predecessors, Pope Francis has already expressed his nervousness about how a new approach to the, quote, role of women is authored, often inspired by the ideology of machismo, unquote, at odds with the fact that, quote, a woman has a different makeup than a man, unquote. And as the Pope launches a grand vision of social reform, totally welcome, we must be aware that Catholic calls to social justice in the modern world, the preferential option for the poor, have traditionally offered an essentially conservative view of the family and of women's role. Everyone has been down this road before. The situation, though, comes at a perilous point for women in religious orders, whose numbers have dwindled from 125,000 to 180,000 in the 1960s to 57,000 today, with a median age approaching 70. Some commenters have sought to dismiss this collapse by noting that the mid-1960s represented an anomalous high point. The number of Roman Catholic religious in 1900 has been pegged at 55,000, so the numbers are not that different. Alas, in 1900, the American population was 76 million. Today, it is 310 million. And Catholics in 1900 numbered 12 million, 16% of the American population. Today, there are 69 million nominal American Catholics, accounting for 22% of the whole. In other words, in 1900, there was one woman religious for every 218 American Catholics. Today, there is one woman religious for every 1,200 American Catholics. And, not to be too pessimistic, one priest for every 1,815 American Catholics. For women religious, then, the institutional church confronts a daunting task. It has not allowed them to the front, and may soon find them gone even from the center. It might be tempting to distinguish at some point between women committed to the church as a professional vocation and those whose lives focused on worldly matters, such as family and reproduction. Surprisingly, though, well, actually not surprising, medieval and modern Catholicism have had little room for them, intellectually or even practically. Devout, for devout Catholic laywomen in the Latin West, marriage and childbearing clashed awkwardly with the eternal demand for chastity. What resulted in medieval Catholicism was a double standard in which committed virgins were, in theory, esteemed over their secular counterparts. In the emerging ideology, a woman's body, no matter how chaste and honored for its offspring, was contaminated. For pious married women, sexuality was not a gift to be celebrated, but a curse to be born. Offspring the penalty. Even the ever-virgin mother of God, the queen of heaven, was wedded to earthly Joseph as a sign of submission to God's will, that she bear and raise a child, while her true spouse was a spiritual one. Unfortunate women who bore children outside wedlock in Catholic lands were outcasts, often forced to abandon their newborns to orphanages. In Ireland, the United States, and other English-speaking countries, the Madeline Asylums, the Madeline Asylums, incarcerated supposedly wayward women in workhouses. Though not exclusively Catholic, in Ireland and elsewhere, the Madeline laundries were run by nuns and supported by the state. Lest we think of these as belonging to a dark and distant past, we should remember that the last such asylum closed in 1996, less than 20 years ago. The church in recent decades has sought contortedly to affirm reproductive women and their bodies, but its contortions may no longer matter. In Europe and the United States, women have bluntly refused to submit to the church's judgment on matters of sexuality and reproduction. 
Humanae Vitae was greeted by mass abandonment of confession and priestly guidance, and pastoral care has never recovered. A 2014 poll conducted by the Spanish language network Univision found that 78% of Catholics worldwide are untroubled by contraception, while other recent surveys have found that 82% of American Catholics find contraception morally acceptable, and 63% continue to support Roe versus Wade. On questions of contraception and sexuality, women have simply ignored the authority of the institutional church, the front, entirely. And perhaps that is the message to send to Francis. No matter how lofty his vision and rhetoric, his human resources are diminishing, and he risks the greater danger that even the most devout are no longer listening. Catholics are getting used to going without priests and without nuns, and maybe even without a Pontifex Maximus. This has become apparent to me in recent years as I have, re as I have repeatedly walked the Camino de Santiago with my beloved Fordham students. The ancient pilgrimage route has surged in popularity recently among women, who now make up over half the pilgrims. And even in this most Catholic of practices conducted in this most Catholic of countries, the religious experiences have ranged far beyond the official boundaries of the church. Most pilgrims don't seem to mind. For Catholics along the route, sacramental devotions are less prominent than more informal prayer opportunities. The masses are few, the church is locked, the clergy often nowhere to be found. For my students, the most meaningful Catholic liturgical experience along their 300 kilometers took place in Leon at Compline, and it was led by a nun. Thank you. <laughs>